Hello, and welcome to the LifeWorks podcast. Joining me today is Marty McEwen. Marty is a licensed professional counselor and coach who specializes in stage fright, performance anxiety, and fear of public speaking for people in business, the arts, the professions, politics, and academics. Marty, it is awesome to have you on the podcast today. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Oh, it's so much fun for me to be here and talk about what I love to do and to share it with people and share it with you. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you. The the reason why I wanted to have you on, Marty, is to give our audience some definitions, some foundational Mm -hmm. definitions around stage fright, performance anxiety, and imposter syndrome, Mm -hmm. uncover the sources of those concepts, and share some real strategies that they can take away with them for curing them. Absolutely. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. So you yourself uh, at one time struggled with Uh, stage fright. Tell us a little bit about that and how you helped yourself. I didn't know I had stage fright until I started to learn to sing. I had always wanted to be a singer and had never taken lessons. I'd been in choirs kind of hiding in the soprano section, you know. Um, (laughs) But I just kind of got an idea that I'd like to take it on for real. And and learn really how to sing and know how know that I was singing well enough that I could feel confident in it, you know, and that anybody would want to listen. (laughs) So I signed up for a voice lesson and the teacher said, you know, to go la 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 la. So I did. And I, and then she had me do breathing exercise, all that sort of thing. And everything was just fine. And then she said, sing me something. And I just went, Oh, I mean, it was a totally involuntary reaction wow. to singing something by mm-hmm. myself, like a song, not the la la la's. I could do that, right. but singing a song in front of someone else completely mm-hmm. knocked me off my socks. Wow! And I couldn't make a sound. Honestly, I couldn't. And and she was a little scared, and I was a little scared because I was just right. so frozen. <laughs> and then she said. Well, just saying Mary had a little lamb, you know, because she was thinking like, I must be thinking I need to sing some aria from an opera or, you know, the latest rock song or something. Right, right. I couldn't even do that. I completely froze for, I I would guess, two minutes. And I finally went, Mary, Mary, you know, I was tense and shaking Mm. and... Boy, it was, it was a shock to me that that happened to me. And it was totally involuntary. It wasn't anything I knew would happen or even suspected would happen. And actually, I, I tried to quit singing a, a number of times. <laughs> 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 and you know how when you really want to do something and you, you try to quit because it's too hard or, or whatever, whatever reason, but you keep coming back around to it, you know? Yeah, it, fi- it keep finds coming you. back around to it, you know, and you're just your instincts are take, taking you in a direction, I think. So and that's what happened. But it wasn't until maybe six months into it, she would have a recital every three months where we would get up and sing in a dinner theater kind of situation mm-hmm. for our friends and family. And every single time that came around, I was standing in the wings and I was shaking and sweating. My heart was racing like crazy. And you don't sing really well, you know, when you're all tense and scared. So uh, there was one time I remember very clearly, I was just that standing in the wings and my body was just in, you know, shakes, but my mind wasn't. It's like, it it was like, I knew the music, I knew the songs, my brain was not worried, Hmm. but my body was still reacting like it was tigers coming out of the woods. And I thought, well, isn't that fascinating? And at the same time, I was studying uh, some um, therapy techniques for my, in my counseling office that have to do with reducing the fight, flight, or freeze response on a physical and psychological level at the same time. And it was working beautifully with people for all kinds of things, for phobias and depression and anxiety of other kinds, whatever it might be. So I thought, wait a minute, why don't I use those same techniques on myself, right? Mm -hmm. See what happens. So I went into my office by myself and I started to apply these methods. And little by little, or really a lot by a lot, if you're going to look at it in terms of whether you ever get over your stage fright or don't, right? I got less and less afraid. Just my physiological response diminished. But but then I started working with people in my practice 
who were performers and speakers and uh, guitar players and harp players and singers and with the same techniques and the same p theory underpinning where it comes from and what to do about it, they got over their stage fright. Wow. And then they could perform freely. It, it really did come from my own like physician heal thyself kind of thing, you know, sure. discovering that I had stage fright that I, I had had a little fear of public speaking earlier. Yeah. Um, but not, not such that it got in my way, but I had some, some insecurity about um, how I was being received in, mm. in speaking, but it wasn't debilitating in any way whatsoever. It wasn't even anything I would ever do or think about doing anything about. Um, but with singing, it came on like gangbusters, and I, there, wasn't, there wasn't any singing if I was going to be suffering like that. So at, at a foundational level, how uh -huh. do you define stage fright, performance anxiety, uh -huh. and imposter syndrome? And imposter syndrome. I think it has to do with the specificity of it. In other words, my, I, my, my definition of stage fright, which is very broad, is the fear of doing anything for someone else's consideration or enjoyment. It doesn't mean to have a stage at all. Let's say you want to write a blog post and you're procrastinating on it and feeling tense about it and you know resisting it. Well, that's because you're putting something out there for someone else's consideration, mm. right? By definition. Mm -hmm. And so in your mind, you have the idea that people are, being, are going to be observing you and evaluating you. I'd say that comes under the broad umbrella of stage fright. Oh. Or you're sitting in a meeting, and we've all had this experience. We're sitting in a meeting with a new group of people, and the, right. the, the leader of the meeting says, let's all go around the table and introduce ourselves. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right? And right. so you're like, you're, you're, your turn is about three quarters of the way around the table. <laughs> I think we all know this one. I'm laughing because I can totally relate with that. <laughs> and you can't hear anybody else what they're saying about themselves. Right. If, you had a, if, you, if, if there was a quiz at the end of the meeting, you'd remember all the people came after you. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> So that's, state, that's a form of stage fright that I think is very common and a lot of people would recognize. Sure. Um, and, and really what it is is that fight, flight, or freeze response kicking up mm. when you are going to offer something for somebody else's consideration or enjoyment. Mm. And you're all concerned about, about that. You're more concerned about that than you are about actually providing the information for their consideration or enjoyment right mm -hmm. that's the broad definition of stage fright to come back to your definition performance anxiety i think has more to do with uh, specifically something where you where it, it's a little more f a formal thing like a test taking mm -hmm. situation okay uh, and an actor in a play you have to perform so there's an element of evaluation there's an element mm -hmm. of how well are you going to do at this there's some stakes involved. Mm -hmm. So interviews, I would put in performance anxiety. Mm -hmm. Now, social anxiety going into a party situation, I wouldn't put that in performance anxiety, unless you think you're performing. To me, imposter syndrome is fundamental insecurity no. about your abilities. It's more pervasive. It's not as situation dependent. When a person really has imposter syndrome, it's awful. I mean, it makes you dread going to work in the morning. It makes you paranoid. People know something about you that you don't know that they know. It's, mm -hmm. it's just an awful mindset to have to live with. But it c could have nothing to do with performing whatsoever. It could just be you're walking around in the world being a fraud, which is awful to think about yourself. I suppose they all do come under the heading of stage fright, and it certainly I address those in my work. But I think they have a little bit of a different angle to them. It's yeah. just, they're just definitions. So any individual person, their situation is unique. It doesn't really need the label. What are the sources inside of us of uh -huh. each of these? And do they all come from different sources or do they all come from the same source? If you talk about it broadly, they all come from the same source. There's something within us that 
is essentially in conflict with what's being asked of us. But what that is in each individual person is distinct. When I discovered that I had such a severe fear of singing and I sat myself down to figure out why did I have this and what to do about it, I started using some techniques that are introspective as well as mind-body techniques. It's a kind of a, mm -hmm. it happens simultaneously. People introspect on what's going on inside and then use these techniques to get more information about what's this about? What do I have this associated with in my brain? The first thing that came up for me as a fourth grade incident, I had a crush on this kid, Steve, and I wanted to impress Steve. Now, Steve and I sat in the front desks of our homeroom and I decided I wanted to dress up to the nines for Steve that day, mm -hmm. asked my mother to take me shopping to get a new dress. I remember the dress absolutely specifically it was a coral colored dress with flowers on it. It had a little belt around the back and I had white shoes on. They got new shoes. I mean, I was wow. somebody, you know, right? Yeah. So I was going to impress Steve. And, and in our school, there was a, a rule that you had to be in your seat by the time the bell stopped ringing or you were late and you'd get docked. So I was very nervous about this whole prospect, but mm. I, I was standing outside in the hallway waiting and the bell started to ring and I go I went, oh my god I have to get in and I ran in the room I ran up the middle aisle toward my seat and the, only to realize that the janitor had waxed the floor the night before and I slept on my shoe went over my head my dress over my head oh. right in front of Steve and the rest of the class and the oh. teacher and they were all howling oh my gosh I know that's literally yeah. the definition of a nightmare. <laughs> it wasn't funny to me. Oh, God. So Everyone sorry. else was laughing. Now, what I realized as I started, first of all, I was surprised that that came up. I never thought about that fourth grade incident before. Yeah. I mean, I thought about it before, but I never would have connected it with a fear of singing. Mm -hmm. So, but I started to clear up the emotional charge that I felt on that. You know how you remember an incident and you go, oh God, that. Well, I started to use the techniques that I've, I'm talking about to clear up the emotional charge on that incident. Mm. And that's what I did that first time I started to work with myself until I couldn't dredge up any more shame about it or any more embarrassment about it. And it just didn't even feel important anymore to me. And the other thing that happened while I was doing that was that I realized they weren't laughing at me. They were laughing at a funny situation. If I yeah. had been one of the kids in that class and somebody else had slipped on their brand new shoes like that, I would have laughed too. It would have been a reflex, right? But it wasn't until I got that emotional charge off of that issue for myself that I could change my perspective. Yeah. Actually, I didn't change my perspective. My, my perspective changed. Mm -hmm. And it was no longer about me feeling humiliated or making a fool of myself. That was the connection between that fourth grade incident and what I decided about that incident and what I decided about myself mm -hmm. and what happened to me when I got up to put myself out as a singer. It, in a way, it's like, I thought singers were cool and I'm not cool. I'm this little kid who humiliated herself. So what am I doing up there singing in front of people? So what, what happens in the brain is that we, our brains make those associations. So when I broke the association with that first incident and feeling the fool to realizing I wasn't the fool, it wasn't about me at all. I'm fond of saying that what, it wasn't that all of a sudden at the end of that session with myself, I went, oh, now I can sing. No, I didn't know if it was going to translate to the actual mm -hmm. situation or not, but it did. Wow. The next time I got up to sing, I was about half as nervous. Wow. But it wasn't God. because I decided anything. That's the key here. It yeah. wasn't because I decided anything like, okay, I'm fine now. No. Or mm -hmm. I fed myself affirmations or anything like that. Mm -hmm. It was a shift in my physiological perception of the situation. Actually, it was a shift in my amygdala's perception of the situation mm -hmm. such that it was not afraid. It was not making that association anymore with the hippocampus, memories in the hippocampus, mm -hmm. and didn't cascade down into a fight, flight, or freeze response, which means my body didn't react, which meant I, would, meant I was calmer. But it, wow. was, but it wasn't it wasn't a cognitive process wow that makes sense it, it does and and it actually prompts a couple of questions for me here mm -hmm. so in your mind there is a connection albeit maybe an unnatural one but there was a connection between 
this fourth grade incident, this, mm-hmm. this really humiliating fourth grade mm-hmm. incident, and your ability to sing? Yes, I would tweak that a little bit. I would say there was a connection between my perception of that incident that got lodged in my memory banks and my feeling of deserving to sing. The hippocampus in the brain is a little kind of horn shape about right back there in your limbic system. It largely has to do with memory storage. And the hippocampus stores memories that are important or might be useful in the future. And the amygdala, that's two little areas right on the front of those of the of the hippocampus, is the part of our brain that is on the lookout for emotional danger. So the memory of that fourth grade incident contained meaning that I had ascribed to it as a fourth yeah. grader, I mean. But my body and my brain had ascribed meaning to that incident about who I am, mm-hmm. what's okay, what's not okay for me to do, what's going to be painful in the future, what I should look yeah. out for not to have that happen again. And so those memories and the amygdalas being vigilant about watching out for danger situation is lodged in our systems. It's not our fault. It's not mm. anything we're doing. It's, but, it, but it gets lodged there. And, and I think I have other reasons for feeling insecure that I could point to. And I continued to work on those this, in the same way. And every time I cleared up something where I felt like I, there was something about offering something to someone else that was my language impeding my energy, I would clear that up. And then I got more and more comfortable and more and more comfortable. Because when you're tense and shaking, you don't sing very well. But so when you're more relaxed, you can sing better. And when you sing better, you get better feedback and it's more fun. And then you get singing better and then you can relax some more so it becomes a positive reinforcing loop rather yeah. than a negative i want to sort of contract compare and contrast the meaning that you had at that time that you uh, uh-huh. associated with that incident and the meaning that you have with it now post work the meaning i have for it now is that it was funny and uh and I was just a little kid with a crush. Oh. What, what little kid doesn't have a crush? The incident certainly mm-hmm. was about me. I mean, that happened to me. But the laughter wasn't about me. The mm-hmm. laughter was about a slapstick moment that yeah. was just literally, objectively funny and would have been funny if it had been me or anybody else. So the work divested that incident of its personal disruption. So when I think of it now, it's, it makes me smile. I think it's so funny. Yeah. And, and partly is because when I tell the story, everybody else thinks it's funny too. Yeah. yeah. And, then, and then they all go, aww. And on some level, they can relate with you, right? I mean, who among us has not had something humiliating happen in our lives? You know, to be honest, there were more things that, that held that in place than just that one incident. And uh, circling back to your original question, I started right there in terms of figuring out why people have stage fright and what to do about it. It's not something you're born with. It's something that is a reaction to something that happened in your life. And it could be an incident like what I just described, or it could be a set of conditions. And one person in a workshop years ago said to me, well, what's the difference between this and just your family situation, for instance, right? Right. Your right. cultural situation. I said, well, those, those are made up of instances, yeah. a whole slew of them, but instances. People said things, people looked at you a certain way, people taught you things. One of the it. things I find interesting about what you're saying, too, is that it seems that we can carry these incidents with us for years. Like you said that it took you some time to divest the emotional charge from mm-hmm. that incident. And I know mm-hmm. we're, we're focusing on that specific incident, but so in, in your work, one of the things that you find is that, that people do carry these things with them for years? Absolutely. As one of my clients years ago said, oh, you mean those things where you go to bed at night and you remember them and you just want to put your head over your pillow? It, and it doesn't have to be that kind of sharp memory, yeah. but people carry not only the events, the objective events, but the feelings that happened at the time and the meaning that we made out of them. Our brains record all of that. An analogy I use a lot is a hologram. If we, our consciousness, our individual consciousness is like a holographic plate. Now, I'm not a scientist. I don't know all the ins and outs and the physics of how holographic plates work, except that I know that there are images embedded in an in a, in a holographic plate and if you and if you shine a laser at certain angles and hit that point it will trigger that holographic image to pop up 
you know, to assemble itself so that we can see it. So we're not always conscious at all of what's embedded in our holographic plate, if you will. The laser beam of our perception triggers it, mm -hmm. right? Just like the laser beam in the holographic plate triggers that holographic image. Mm -hmm. So when the laser of our perception triggers that, it's like activating this hologram in ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that feels and looks real to us. And it has all of the, the, the actual what happened and the emotional reaction we had to it and, and the meaning that we assigned to it, all mm -hmm. embedded in it. The work I do is that we actually activate that as best we can on purpose, but in a safe environment. Like I don't mm -hmm. you know, throw people mm -hmm. up on a stage with a thousand people. Right. But but vicariously activate that part of our consciousness and then use techniques that will dismantle that. So that then when you put the laser beam of your attention on that point in your experience, nothing happens. And then you're free to do whatever you want to do without the encumbrance of this emotional charge that's left over from whatever. And, and as I say, it could be events or it could be conditions. You know, it could be your critical father that you lived with for 15 years. Or could. One story was a guy who had a job where all of a sudden he needed to get up in front of people and make presentations that he hadn't, been, hadn't had to do before. Yeah. Um, and he ran into his own state fear of public speaking, you would call that, right? Well, among other things, one incident that he remembered was that he'd been in Montessori school for most of his early years, which is very freewheeling and you know talk to his friends and choose what he wanted to do and and for whatever reason his family moved to a different city and he was put in catholic school oh wow just the opposite he the was expected opposite. to sit in his sure. seat and not say anything well he was a very gregarious guy and he w wanted to make friends so he didn't know the difference so he was he would talk in class but the teacher <laughs> got furious and called him up in front of the class and raked him over the coals for something that he hadn't even learned yet. And mm -hmm. really, it was like a shocking experience for him. And when we cleared that incident up, he was much better able to make presentations because that incident wasn't dogging him on a subconscious level. The, one of the connections we made when we talked about it was that this shock of being brought up like that when he was trying to make friends and... Mm -hmm be liked and it happened when he he was standing up in front of the group having everybody looking at him so some of the elements that the associative elements were that he was standing up in front of a group and he was trying to make friends and be liked so ta-da same context so when we cleared up that incident that had similar elements to it he was much more comfortable because it didn't have the same meaning anymore saying that's just another example of it isn't the luck of the draw it isn't your you weren't born with it. And the happy news is that there's a reason. So we can get at that reason, clear it up so that's not activated. What is happening biologically when we get stage fright? Well, first it happens in our perceptions, right? So in all these examples that I'm giving you, there are some not necessarily literal similarities, but some kind of context or some kind of association that gets triggered by the present day situation. One of them is just plain visibility to other people, seeing other people seeing you. My, my coin turn for it is mirrored visibility. Many of the incidents that I've encountered with people have that element at the base, which is mm -hmm. it's a situation where other people are seeing you and you're seeing that other people are seeing you. So let's just use that. So you come to a situation and oh, you see people seeing you and all of a sudden it's like ah! well what's happening is that, that that sensation or perception comes into your brain through the sensory apparatus the amygdala picks up on it checks with the hippocampus to see if there's a similar thing we should be afraid of in the file folders of the memories of the of the hippocampus is this something we should we should be on alert about and if there is that connection the amygdala then sends a signal, biochemical signal, to the thalamus and the, the, and the pituitary glands, which then go down in, through the nervous system and to the adrenal glands, right, uh, right above your kidneys, mm -hmm. that go on alert and shoot out cortisol and adrenaline into your system. And that's what causes those symptoms. And then, because you're having those symptoms, your brain in response goes, oh my God, this must be really scary. 
the perception of something that you have an association with triggers that fight, flight, or freeze response from the amygdala into the body. And then the body then gives your brain the idea there must be actually something to be afraid of. So you can try to talk yourself out of it, but the prefrontal cortex, you know, right up here, yeah. where your cognitive thinking processes are and uh, um, isn't the, the signal when you're in a reactive mode, the signal from the prefrontal cortex is not as strong as to, um, to the amygdala. In other words, yeah. the part of you that says, you know, it's okay, we're fine. I know what I'm doing. I'll be fine. Yeah. That part is not as strong as the, oh my God, you know, part. And I wonder if the location of the amygdala being so close to our spinal column has anything to do with that. Well, it's the limbic system in the middle of your brain. Yeah, that is yeah. connected to the, you know, the brainstem. But, mm -hmm. and it's also the, the, the vagus nerve, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it hooks in there and goes around and down and into all of your viscera. The vagus nerve is part of the polyvagal system mm -hmm. that, that triggers the parasympathetic nervous system. So when the vagus nerve is activated, it actually slows your system down mm. as opposed to the, right? You, maybe you remember from school, the sympathetic nervous system revs you up and the parasympathetic nervous system calms you down on physiological ways in the autonomic nervous system where you don't have conscious control. So that's what happens phys physiologically. And then when we do this energy work, it has the function because we can observe it, not that we know what the mechanism is, but because we can observe it, it literally disconnects that fight, flight, or freeze response from the perception. So the perception is still there. Mm -hmm. I can remember what happened in fourth grade, but the emotional and meaning response isn't. It, it changes the way that our bodies react to a perception. And it really works. I mean, the rapid relief from stress and distress class that I teach, uh, it's a workshop really two-hour workshop, demonstrates this. What we do is have people at the beginning of the class identify something that's bothering them. Yeah. I mean, who doesn't have something that bothers them, right? Sure. And then we rate that from zero to 10. So mm -hmm. I might say, I have a conflict at work. It might not have anything to do with stage fright or performing. I have a conflict at work and it's really bothering me and so on. And it's, it's bothering me to a nine let's say out of 10. Mm -hmm. And then we go through these very specific uh, mind, body, energy exercises that, that we call, my colleague and I who developed this, Stephanie Eldringhoff and I developed this. We go through each of those exercises and again, rate the intensity of that, percept, the perception, right, of that conflict at work or whatever it is. And predictably, the felt sense of it diminishes from the beginning to the end. So it's demonstrable. And I have a spreadsheet, in fact, of like over 150 instances of people and what happened to them with particular issue they're facing from the beginning to the end of the rapid relief process. Mm -hmm. This is that technique that we developed. Most recently, there was a woman in one of my classes who had a fear of technology. She had a PhD and she was quite the bright person, but she had an anxiety response about technology. And that was the thing that she chose to address mm -hmm. in the rapid relief from stress and distress class. Mm -hmm. And she reported to me not long after that she had been able to figure out a program or something. Somebody was teaching her a program and she had no anxiety about it at all, which was a physiological difference. In other yeah. words, she just didn't have the anxiety. It wasn't that she had to talk herself out of hang or be it or give herself a lot of reassuring affirmations or something. Right. She just didn't have that reaction. So what strikes me about what you're saying is that a lot of the, the work that you're doing is really is done in the conscious mind. Like you're reaching back, you're looking, you're, you're reaching back into some conscious memory, right? I mean, it, it's, it's something that you can remember. You bring it to the fore, you process it. Mm -hmm. And you process it enough that eventually, and correct me if I'm wrong in, in this, that, that, that through the work that eventually mm -hmm. it gets refiled back into our subconscious mind as resolved? Yeah, it's not threatening. The only tweak I would do on that was, is that it doesn't necessarily have to be something we're conscious of until we start working. And then, oh, I remember, I didn't remember that fourth grade incident until, right. until it popped right up. What, and there's another 
little fun analogy. It's kind of like a cafeteria plates. That's one pops up. Oh, we can take care of the fourth grade incident. Oh yeah. Then there was that time my dad told me not to sing so loud in front of my family. Okay. Yeah. And then there was the time that, you know what I mean? Then there was the time that, <laughs> these are real. Then there was the time in middle school where I wanted to be in the glee club. It was singing, right? And my teacher looked at me with the saddest face after I had uh, auditioned. And she said, you know, I'm so sorry. You're not a first soprano. You're a second soprano. I didn't know anything about music. I didn't know. I thought that meant, yeah. you know, like second chair violin. Like, right. you're no good. Yeah, no, it's not that at all. <laughs> it's not that at all. It has to do with the range your voice falls. Right, the voice right? part, I mean, yeah. I didn't know that. I thought it meant that I wasn't any good. So, oh, yeah. so the cafeteria plate, the more of those that, that actually, like you say, got refiled more mm. appropriately and that the electrical charge on those memories was neutralized, then I was more and more free to sing without all that baggage. Why is it important to overcome stage fright? Like, how do you see that benefiting someone? Well, there are certainly practical ways and financial ways and, you know, um, like for me, I wanted to sing and then yeah. certainly getting over my stage fright was a necessary thing for me to learn how to sing sure. and to be confident and comfortable that anyone would want to hear me, right? That I was a good enough singer, albeit an amateur jazz singer. And so for me to be able to do something that I knew I wanted to do and have fun at it and not be plagued mm. by all that discomfort. So I think that's certainly one thing. Or there was a, a fellow in my practice a couple years ago. He had progressed to the point where he was the chief marketing officer of a very large global organization. And the CEO decided that his senior people should go around the world and give keynote speeches to the employees of that organization to the tune of a thousand to three thousand people at a time. And this client of mine was just he he just about quit his job. Goodness. It was he was so miserable over it. And and he had had some fear of public speaking on smaller stages, you know, and with smaller groups and leading his teams and that sort of thing. But it wasn't like like me. It wasn't debilitating. But when he was asked to do this these big keynote speeches he just couldn't do it he wow. he was going to quit his job so just a bit maybe before covid or may, i'm going to guess about 10 months ago or so got a an email from him that he had just in his best keynote ever in front of several thousand people somewhere in the world and was doing fine and was continuing to do the exercises and the work on getting even more comfortable but he was able to do it and boy what when you say what are the results the results is he didn't quit his job and i think probably there are lots and lots of people in that situation either they won't go for a promotion because it would involve that or they don't do well or decide not to continue with the job if it's going to be so miserable for them i think too getting over stage fright is generalizes. One of my definitions for stage fright is impeded energy. No. And the definition of confidence in the opposite is unimpeded energy. So when my energy is not impeded, then I am free to flow. My energy can run in an outward direction without clamping up. And I think that for me, clearing up my stage fright about singing helped me be freer as a person because the impedance that was lodged in my system about, oh, what are they going to think of me? Or I'm making no. a fool of myself or what right do I have to do this? Or yeah. any number of things that could be behind stage fright can also be operating in other places in people's lives. So there can be a ripple effect there. How do we unimpede energy? The energy that I'm talking about is in, in many circles called subtle energy. Mm -hmm. And all in, in all cultures, forever. People have worked with subtle energy in various ways. Western medicine is probably the only place that is just catching on, that the subtle energy systems are a very real part of our operating systems and therefore can be intervened with and enhanced and strengthened. And that that has then a an effect on our mental and emotional and physical systems. The subtle energies I'm talking about are acupuncture, the chakras, uh, the auric field, the electromagnetic field that we can't see, or at least most of us can't see, yeah. some of us can, uh, that emanates from our bodies. Those are the subtle energies that we use, that I use. Uh, Stephanie Eldringhoff, my co-developer of the rapid relief process, 
uses to intervene with these fight, flight, or freeze responses or other emotional or psychological states through those systems. It's almost like your energy system is the glue that holds those in place keeps them in your holographic plate. And we really don't know the mechanism of it, but what we, what we do know is that when we use these techniques, the result is that when we look at that, or we shine the laser of our consciousness on those points in the holographic plate, it doesn't pop up as a hologram anymore. Mm -hmm. It doesn't activate. So we don't know enough about these subtle energies. We know they're there. They can be photographed. There are uh, scientists looking at a particular kind of node on the nervous system that seems to follow the path of the acupuncture meridians. Mm -hmm. You may be aware that the acupuncture meridians, which are channels of energy that run through, they're not visible to us, but there are certain points, there's like 365 points on the acupuncture systems that are more conductive electrically than you can actually measure that. And they, and they correspond with the place that acupuncturists would put needles if you were doing actual acupuncture. But there are many ways to strengthen and connect the acupuncture meridians, even in the face of that perception that ordinarily would have them out of balance. So it's like counteracting the, the state and then that neutralizes it. The same with the chakras and the, and the auric field. One of the exercises in the rapid relief process is called the rapid relief energy sweep, where we sweep the meridians in, a, in the direction of their flow, even while you're thinking about this troublesome thing, and also have you expand your perception of your own space, even while you're thinking about this particular thing. And not only does it feel wonderful, but it also uh, diminishes the negative valence mm. on that particular perception. How does curing stage fright, performance anxiety, imposter syndrome benefit and impact other areas of our life or business? Like for example, stress management, mm -hmm. Uh, and, and other things like that. If you're freer of these yeah. emotional reactions, first of all, you're going to handle situations better. I used the uh, example of a conflict at work. There was somebody in my one of my recent classes who wanted to clear up her upset about a, a conflict at work. Mm. And the result was that she was able to attend this very sensitive meeting coming from a whole different place than she would have otherwise. And so the outcome was different. So imagine if we all had the tools when we could recognize that we were hooked by something, to use an old term for activated by something, and we could actually stop and say, wait a minute, I'm going to handle this better if I'm calmer, and use these techniques to calm down and then go into a situation. How many situations would end up differently? Right. How many arguments with spouses? How many reactivities to children who aren't behaving? It would be amazing if people came at things with a, a more centered and grounded perception or approach or whatever mindset, if you will. So it does generalize that way. And the rapid relief process that mm -hmm. Stephanie and I develop, they're not about stage fright. They're about any kind of emotional upset. And we were using them in our practices way long before I had discovered the stage fright that I had. So really applying the rapid relief process or other things similar to that to stage fright is one application of a process that can make a positive difference in any area of life. You're solving more than just stage fright. You're solving pervasive and general issues. Yes. And you talked, you asked about stress, stress levels. It's definitely a de-stressor because if you're not activating that cortisol, it's that heightened level of cortisol, right? And adrenaline that is stress. And the domino effect and the fallout of a particular chronic stress is what causes a physical, all those physical mm. issues that are related to stress. So since we do have some techniques to intervene with that cortisol response, then that's going to have domino effects in a good way on our physical health as well. You mentioned the rapid relief process a couple of times. Uh -huh. What can you tell us about that in terms of the framework? Or what can you share about that? Uh -huh. Sure. It's six exercises. Stephanie Eldringhoff and I learned something called thought field therapy 25 years ago. And we've just been partners in this since then. Yeah. And as we went along, we learned all kinds of different interventions, if you will, into the subtle energy systems. And we sat down and picked out, she has a long time marriage and family therapy practice, and I have a long time mental health counseling practice. We picked out the elements or the techniques that we thought were doing the best for as many people as possible, right? Mm -hmm. 
the biggest bang for your buck in terms of, <laughs> of, in terms of issues and in terms of people. And we chose six exercises, some of which came from thought field therapy originally because they were just so effective, and some that are combinations of other things that neutralize as many issues for as many people as possible and put it into a comprehensive set of exercises, a process, method, techniques that people could learn and apply to themselves. So they can make a big difference in how they react to situations on their own. So some of the elements that are involved with these exercises are, as I said, the acupuncture meridians, the chakras and the auric field, but also there's a left right brain integration process called EMDR that's used, it has extensive research and is used by therapists to uh, resolve trauma and reactions mm -hmm. to past trauma. And so we have incorporated some left right brain integration. Wow. Some of the exercises are based on Qigong, oh. some of the and Tai Chi, which in turn are based on the meridian systems. Sure. So the so these set the set of six exercises that is the rapid relief process mm -hmm. comes at it from a lot of different angles. Wow. Because let's say you're upset about let's say something's going on in your life, right? Let's say you had a fight with somebody and you got your feelings hurt and it's really sticking with you. We don't know where in your energy, what's the best intervention for that particular issue for you at this particular time. So what we do is to go through, uh, especially in the class, we go through these exercises and if there's a diminishment of your pain about it, then you needed that exercise. Mm -hmm. If there isn't, you didn't need that exercise. And we do that all the way through. There are two exercises that are really the meat of the matter, you know, that, that cover the most, the most energy imbalances for the most people. Mm -hmm. And some of the other exercises kind of take care of things that we might miss otherwise. How is your approach to curing stage fright different mm -hmm. than other approaches in the marketplace? The vast majority of five tips for getting over stage fright, you know, or whatever, right. have to do with more external things, mm -hmm. if you will. The energy piece, the piece of the stage fright cure that really is different is that piece where we're dismantling or neutralizing our previous experiences and in emotional states and self-assessment and meanings that are triggering the stage fright response on an involuntary level. The vast majority of what you'll read about or hear about has to do with the voluntary level has to do with practice, practice, practice. It has to do with not the audience in the under in their underwear. I, I mean, I don't think anybody seriously offers that as a as a technique. Right, right. <laughs> so, so the stage. I want to the stage fright cure is also a little bit more than just the rapid relief process. So, I want to just outline. There's four stages, mm -hmm. and, and the stages are not like linear stages. They're more I, more like um, aspect to getting over stage fright. Now, one of them we've already done here because the first one is to get objective about what's going on and to regard the stage fright response as something that's happening in your body, not a personality characteristic. And to be able to get into an observational position, if you will, about that. Mm -hmm. It's like if you have a cold, you have a cold. Yeah. You're not your cold. True. You're not a person who has colds. Right. You have a cold. It's something that's going on in your system. Or if you have a pain in your thumb, it's over there. You Oh, I have a pain in my thumb. I am not a person who has thumb pain as a, something wrong with me because I have a pain in my thumb. I can observe it and I can attribute it to something. Right. And if I can attribute it to something, that gives me the power to do something about it. Mm -hmm. so that's the first thing. The second element is to create safety in your present yeah. day world. Like an analogy there is, and it's, it's a little serious, but if I'm working with someone, for instance, who's in a traumatic relationship, first thing is create safety for that person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Before you do any clearing up of trauma, you want to make sure that person is safe. And that, that goes with this too. In other words, there are all kinds of ways that are in fact external or you know, not on an energy level right. that you can create safety for yourself. One of them is practice, 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 of course. But why is that? Be not because practice, practice, practice always does the trick, but because your amygdala loves familiarity and certainty. And so if, you, if your amygdala perceives that you are... Uh, familiar and certain about mm. this, whatever it is, it will relax. It won't, it won't fire off as much. Mm. So I'm, I'm very fond of saying you don't have stage fright. Your amygdala has stage fright. <laughs>
<laughs> right. right. Which is really true. And if you, no, and if, no. if, if the first, the first step is to recognize that, well, you know, I were talking about that fourth grade incident, talking about objectivity, what happened when I cleared up the emotional charge on it, I got objective about it. It's yeah. like, oh, this wasn't about me. This wasn't about my failing as a person. This was something that happened that was funny. Yeah. So, so that the first is getting objective. The second is to create safety in all kinds of different ways you can do that. Mental ways, physical ways, the way you arrange the space, the lighting, whatever it might be, to help you feel comfortable in very practical ways. And then the rapid relief process can go even deeper and dismantle those origins mm -hmm. of your reaction. And it can also amplify positive ways that you think about yourself, mm. positive outcomes, mm. and the positive perception of things. And as, as you continue to do all four of those elements, you just get more and more comfortable with whatever you're doing. It would seem that in your work that you're, you're about finding people's confidence as, as one of the stages of your work. Mm -hmm. um, I, I want to ask you about that. Where does confidence come from for us? I think you're thinking about it backwards. I think mm -hmm. what happens to our natural conf confidence as we go through our lives. Think about a baby learning to walk. Confidence isn't even an issue. Confidence uh. isn't it. It's they're they're going to learn to walk. They're going to fall down a bunch. They're going to get up. They're going to fall down. They're going to get up. And I mentioned that my definition of confidence is unimpeded energy. That mm -hmm. baby has unimpeded energy about it. They're just doing what they're doing. And it does, they don't do it perfectly. There's a lot of falling down involved. <laughs> but, and it's a learning process. Of course, it's a learning process, right? There's no impeded energy there. Mm -hmm. they don't, the baby doesn't stop and go, oh, God, I fell down. I don't think I'll ever get up again, you know? <laughs> We do that a lot, right? We do that a lot, don't we? Yeah. And so I think that confidence gets undermined rather than that we develop confidence. So, so if you think about it in terms of getting everything out of the way that's impeding your confidence, then you can start to think of a lot of different things you can do to, to enhance and encourage the confidence that's already a potential yeah. for everybody, I think. Uh, you're, what you're witnessing right now is me having an epiphany, actually. Oh, tell me. Uh, because what, what I hear you saying, and, 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 and it makes a lot of sense, is that confidence is not something that we, that we build and work on and affirmations and, you know, like, we, you know, like it's, a, it's not a construct. It's, it's something that we have naturally. We're born with it. It's innate. Mm -hmm. We all have it. Mm -hmm. What you're saying is that, that, our, we are impeding our own confidence, which is a natural state for us. That's through, what I think. Wow. That's, mm -hmm. that's an incredible insight, actually, and very empowering when you th think about it. Now, now there, there, I th kind of like that, that to me is essentially what confidence is. Now, there's another way people use confidence in the sense of certainty and security in something. Right, right. Like, so yes, that part you can build. In other words, when, when a baby is learning to walk, there's no, there's, they're not lacking in confidence. Mm. It's a learning process. And at the same time, using confidence in a little different light, every time they start building those muscles and they start to be able mm -hmm. to get from here to there without falling over, right. they're going to feel more secure in their ability to do that. A voice teacher of mine some time ago said, I was kind of reluctant to go out and actually ask anybody for money to hear me sing. Yeah, <laughs> right. Right. And he said, Marty, the way you get good is to go gig. And it was like, oh, I thought it was the other way around. I thought you had to be really good first. And uh, that was a revelation to me. It's like, yeah. oh, yeah, okay. I, and as I continue to do that, I'm going to get better. And then I'm going to have more confidence in my singing. But, and that adds to my intrinsic confidence, certainly. Sure. But... I don't have to have 100% confidence in my singing in order to have intrinsic confidence. Yeah. But if I don't have intrinsic confidence, if, that, if my, my God-given original yeah. confidence is somehow disrupted, that's going to have an effect yeah. on my intrinsic confidence and in my confidence in what I do or don't do. Circling back, I think that that's part of what imposter syndrome is, mm. is having learned somewhere along the way 
not to have confidence in what you do at the level that you're doing it in a realistic, at a realistic observational level. Like, you know, a baby doesn't walk perfectly right off the bat. Can you give us an example of a person that you worked with who may have had deathly stage fright Mm -hmm. and were able to turn them around to find huge confidence? Yeah, I'm going to talk about again, that that CMO guy that I talked to about earlier, he was just stopped in his tracks. He would he would shake, he would lose his train of thought, not remember what he was supposed to cover in a meeting. His stomach would be flip flopping or nauseous, Mm -hmm. all of those symptoms, he was a wreck. You know, here's another point too, that kind of goes back to a question you asked earlier about the ripple effect on the rest of our lives. He not only was internally having a a severe reaction to any kind of performance, but it also was keeping him up at night. He would worry about a meeting or a a presentation for months before he'd have to do this. Goodness. Um, It would make him tense around his family reported a couple of times that he'd snapped at his kids in ways that he didn't, because he was so concerned inside. And then I worked with him, I'm going to say up, upwards of a year on the energetic side, but also on the create safety side and also about all the things I just mentioned. And one of the things about him was that <laughs> he thought that he needed to be Tony Robbins right. and he wasn't Tony Robbins. He was this laid back, lanky, mm. really nice guy and very unassuming. And, and he had just climbed the ranks in marketing and sales because he was good at it. He wasn't trying to be anybody fancy, but when it came to speaking, all of a sudden he had this expectation about it he, that he couldn't just be himself on stage. He had to be somebody. And right, know. right. And not only did he not feel like he could do that, he didn't want to do that because his personal integrity would be out of line if he got mm-hmm. up and tried to do that. So he, we, it, it took him a while to get convinced that he could have his own style of presenting himself in his own personality could come right. out and he didn't have to be somebody he wasn't. Yeah. That was the one I mentioned earlier where he was having the, all those difficulties and, and then eventually he was able to keep his job. Mm-hmm. Or he was able to decide not to quit his job right? <laughs> because he had to get up and give keynote speeches for thousands of people at a time. So yeah. that was a big turnaround for him. That's, that, that's an amazing case study actually. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that I learned from that is that you even said it, that you worked with him for some time that getting mm-hmm. over stage fright, it would seem is, you mentioned it, happens in increments. It's not mm-hmm. a wholesale innovative change overnight. You do one exercise or one set of exercises on a weekend and then boom, you're done. Would you agree with that? That it, it- I, For the most part, yes. I have definitely had people turn around on a dime. Oh, really? Yep. I had a, a high school young woman who had fear of singing and she wanted to go into musical theater, at least that she was thinking of it. And I met with her, I think three times and we nailed it. She went off and sang. On the other hand, so as I said, these techniques are not just for performing. A friend of mine, I was telling her about these techniques way early on and she's, oh, I have a fear of spiders. And we couldn't budget for the longest time for you know mm. quite a few sessions. We were not mm-hmm. getting very far, which is highly unusual with these kinds of techniques. And so finally I said, well, pinpoint exactly when your fear of spiders started. Mm. And she had told me about that before. I mean, it was, that was a standard question that I would want to know. But I, tell me again, you know, when did this start? And she burst into tears, totally surprised by her own reaction, and started telling me about a situation where she'd been bullied on the bus the first day of middle school. Some yeah. jerk kid on the bus yeah. came up and started punching her in the arm and wouldn't let, wouldn't let go. And nobody did anything about it. And she called her mom and the mom came to school. And then she had to live with this kid in middle school for another three years. For, it took us quite a while to dismantle that for her because there were so many aspects of the situation There was the bullying incident, Mm. avoiding him for three years in school, all of that. And the only reason we know that it was connected to spiders was that every time we cleared up some aspect of that episode in her life, her fear of spiders diminished. The only reason we could figure out what the connection was is that that kid was creepy. He crept up on her and he was like slimy and he was sneaky, that kid. Yeah. So that that's another example of that, that kind of perceptual similarity. Even though the circumstances are totally different, right. there was an underpinning of similarity for her brain that would yeah. send her into... A fear response when she saw creepy, slimy, sneaky. 
I want to get out of the realm of stage fright for just a moment. And I want to ask you just a few questions around lessons learned and just general advice, you know, things like that. If you could outline your own one, two, three success formula, what would that be? Number one, I would say, trust yourself. Mm -hmm. I would say, be sensitive to what's true about you and trust it. One of the exercises in the rapid relief process has a phrase attached to it. People actually put some vibration into certain acupuncture points while we're doing it. But the phrase is, even if this is true, whatever it is that people are wanting to clear up, I deeply and completely love and accept myself with compassion and respect. And that phrase, sometimes people just tear up at saying that phrase because it's something that it's an attitude toward ourselves that we're usually not taught to have. I deeply and completely love and accept myself with compassion and respect. That's a phrase that came from thought field therapy from Roger, Dr. Roger Callahan, who originated thought field therapy. We put the compassion and respect part at the end. And I really love that because it compassion, if you're on yin and yang, you know, It's the yin side of positive self-regard. And respect is the yang side of positive self-regard. So that attitude toward ourselves helps us to not only recognize what's true about us, but also to trust it. Number two, notice what you're drawn to. And in the same spirit of what I said, number one, notice what you're drawn to and pursue it. And I think the third is to recognize that everything's a process and and not only trust yourself, but trust the process. If I look back on my life, I can totally see the pieces of my life that got me to here. I was very insecure as a young person, I don't, don't get me wrong. I was in the theater club in high school. Then I majored in drama and speech and drama in uh, college, but I wasn't very good at it. Then I got a job teaching speech and drama at a private school here in Seattle. And then my then husband had an affair with my best friend and my marriage blew up and I went through a terrible time. Wow. So I went back to school, of course, and studied psychology. <laughs> what else do you do? Right. You know? Then I went to graduate school and I didn't have anything to do with theater or speech or anything or performing. I wasn't doing any of that. And then I started my private practice and then I started, I tried to learn to sing and then I learned energy psychology and then all of those things, you can see how yeah. they all wove together. But I didn't know that at the time when I was going through those things, I didn't know what, how they were contributing to where I would get to. And yeah. so For a younger person who is in that process, I would say trust the process and realize that whatever's going on has a benefit. What is the greatest lesson learned either in life or business that you could share with someone else? That there's a place within us of happiness and joy, that there's a place of knowing in us that's not physical or mental or emotional, but Mm -hmm. it's about our energy. It's Mm -hmm. contacting our energy and what we bring to any situation and how we choose to feel that we can tap into that energy and bring it to our lives. I'm actually not even talking about energy like acupuncture and chakras and that sort of thing. I you know, use those all the time. I'm talking about a really basic sense of joy in life that's accessible to us when we know where to look and when we get all the other things that that get in the way out of the way. What do you want most for your life? I have a wonderful life. But just in terms of goals, I want the rapid relief process out there. I want people to know about this, not just not just the specific techniques, although I certainly want people to know the specific techniques, but the, the realization that you can actually work with your own energy and shift yeah. your perceptions and how you show up in the world for yourself and for other people. Mm. It isn't just a luck of the draw. It isn't just rolling the dice. Right. You're not helpless. There are ways for us to work with ourselves to improve ourselves and our life and our sense of joy in the world that I just mentioned yeah. in a very real way. Where can people find you online? Yes. Stagefright.com is where you can find me online. And also the, uh, the information page for the Rapid Relief from Stress and Distress class that I've been talking about, this two-hour online Zoom class that I'm currently offering for free. The information page for that is stagefright.com forward slash rapid relief. Is there anything that I haven't asked you? (laughs) (laughs) No, I think you've asked me everything under the sun. I just want to say I just absolutely love doing this. You're a terrific person just to have a conversation with and feel really comfortable with, and I appreciate that so much. Um, And I really do want people to go to stagefright.com, whether they have stage fright or not, 
and look at the page for the free rapid relief from stress and distress class and sign up for one of the future upcoming dates that are available there yeah. because it's so profound that we can make changes in our lives and our other people's lives and how situations turn out when we have the right tools to do it. Marty, this has been amazing. My eyes have been opened during the, our, our time together here. Thank you so much for taking time out of your life to spend it with me and sharing a, a little bit of your experience mm -hmm. and your wisdom. Um, for everyone out there, her website is www.stagefright.com. Find Marty, connect with her. She's an incredible human being. Marty, thank you again. Thank you so much time. too. It's been a delight. <laughs>